Okay, so for Kangaroo, um, the main thing to look at is these components under main. These are the solvers uh, that come with Kangaroo. So there's a couple different ones. The main one is just going to be the solver. This is the thing that we can give all of our rules to, all of our meshes, points, curves into that. That'll do the simulation and it'll give us a result um, on the output. So there's a couple different. Hey, Arjun, are you meant to be sharing your screen? We don't see it on Zoom. Ah, I see as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so for Kangaroo, um, the solvers are in this main tab. Uh, if you can see the Kangaroo tab, everyone should have it. Um, yeah, as I said, this is the main solver that we'll use today. Uh, there's a couple other ones too. There's the bouncy solver, which has some momentum to it, uh, which adds another level of force onto the system. Um, there's a step solver, so if you want to see sequential frames of the simulation, then you use that one. Or if you just want to let it run and see the very last output, then you can use the zombie solver, um, which just might be quicker because it's not uh, previewing the geometry at all times. Um, but the most, the best one to use today is going to be the solver, so we'll get to that. Uh, everything else, though, everything to the left of the main tab is all the goals. So it's split up into different sections of what kind of geometry it utilizes. Um, so the goal point is everything that we can do to points. Uh, so we can anchor them, which we'll do today. We can add loads or gravity or magnetization um, onto the points. There's things to keep uh, points, in this case, on different surfaces. So if we want to snap stuff to mesh, we can do that, or snap stuff to a curve. Um, goals for a mesh, uh, so we can uh, input a mesh and then give it certain characteristics like wind or vertex loads. Um, or minimal like surface soap films or pressure if we want to inflate some kind of fabric, uh, if we're talking about meshes and fabric. Um, goals for, for lines, so if you want like tension rods or strings or something to hold things down, we can do that. Uh, a lot of collision things, if we're doing like a simulation with a lot of uh, hard or soft bodies. Um, and then some other things which I, which I don't use much, but you could explore uh, if you're interested. And then we might have used some things from this tab before. This is a utility. So if we have multiple points or multiple lines, we can easily remove those. I think we've used that in the past to clean things up, especially for the shortest walk um, class that we did. Um, so there's some fun stuff in there that could be utilized even if you're not using Kangaroo. Um, but to start off, we'll get started making that roof structure. Um, so the main thing that I shared with you all is just this curve component. Don't, don't worry about the ones down here yet. Um, but the curve up top, I just have a curve in here. Uh, you can also draw your own curve and set that into this component, um, which I urge you to do. It'd be more interesting if everyone had like slightly different curves to see different shapes. Um, but I gave you this one uh, just because we can see that it doesn't have to be flat. It can be any shape. Um, so you can really play around with this curve. You could also bake the curve into Grasshopper and then just edit the one that I gave you, um, which I'll do that a little bit. Maybe move some points around. Um, and then again, if you are drawing your own curve, we'll just have to right click on the component and set that curve. And then we should see an update to follow the green outline, just to make sure that you can get a curve in there. And if you are setting a curve, then it is live. So you can move that curve in Rhino and it'll update in Grasshopper in real time. So I'll give everyone a minute just to do that if you are setting your own curve.
Okay, just finish drawing up your curves and we'll move on to the next step, um, unless anyone has questions on, on making curves, but if not. Um, in order to put this into Kangaroo to simulate a surface, to inflate that, uh, we'll need to make a, some kind of surface or mesh within the curve that we drew. Uh, the easiest way to do that, um, there's a lot of tools in the surface section to create surfaces. Um, we'll just use the, uh, the patch component today. Um, the patch will just take an input curve and add a surface within that curve. Um, you could also use boundary surface. They do very similar things. Uh, but we'll just use patch for right now. Uh, and very simply, all you have to do is, is plug your curve in, and it should fill that in with the surface uh, in the best way that it can. Uh, there's a lot of other components in here that might uh, only make surfaces on planar curves. It, the curve has to be flat, but in this case, the curve does not have to be flat. We can make any surface we want. You might note too, with this patch component, the output is gonna be a trimmed surface, which just means that uh, if we're thinking about UVs as we have in the past, um, the surface here is technically a square. We just can't see the full square because it's been trimmed to fit within our curve. Um, but just to note, um, if you're playing around with it, there's a difference between trimmed and untrimmed surfaces. Okay, so we have this surface here, uh, but we can't use a surface in Kangaroo. Uh, it's a boundary representation. It doesn't actually have any physical components to simulate. So in order to do that, we'll have to convert it into a mesh. And we can do that just the same way we do. Anytime we're converting a BREP or a surface into a mesh, we can just use the mesh BREP component, wire those together, and we'll get a mesh representation of that surface that we just made. So pretty much the same thing. Uh, it looks visually not any different, but it has changed states from a surface to a mesh. So it does have edges now on the inside. Um, and we can preview those edges uh, with any mesh edges component. Um, this isn't going to be necessary for Kangaroo, but it is good to see uh, what our mesh looks like, uh, at least the edges of this, um, because the edges are going to be the important thing when we're simulating. Uh, we'll add tension to all of the edges so that the surface doesn't just explode. Uh, we need something to contain it, and that's going to be, if you could imagine, like strings on a tarp or something, like those are the edges that will hold it down um, when the gravity tries to pull it the other direction. So right now, everyone's surface probably looks a little bit different. Your edges probably look a little bit different, um, but you are probably seeing some kind of non-uniform collection of edges. So in this case, on my screen, we have a lot of squares. But then near the edge, it starts breaking up into triangles to, to form that more high res boundary, um, which in this case, since all the edges are very different scales, uh, it's going to simulate a little roughly. So all of the short curves are going to pull a lot more than the long curves, and we'll just get a really weird surface. So there's two ways to fix that, uh, depending what Rhino you have. If you have Rhino 7, um, it comes with a quad remesh component, which I would recommend you use if you have Rhino 7. So quad remesh looks like this. Uh, if you have Rhino 6, there are a triangle remeshing option, which is just in the mesh tab. Uh, and these two things, by their namesake, the quad remesh is going to remesh this into a lot of squares, and the triangle remesh is going to remesh into a lot of triangles. It'll give us similar outputs. The square will be slightly cleaner. So I do recommend it, but I know not everyone has Rhino 7, so the try remesh works as well. Um, firstly, for the quad remesh, for the people that can use that, um, we'll do like both of these separately. The quad remesh, in order for it to run, uh, it also needs quad remesh settings. So if you type quad remesh again, we'll also get the settings uh, component. And this will allow us to set the number of faces that we want in our final mesh. So that'll calculate how many squares it's trying to put within this mesh. One easy thing we could do, um, it'll probably be, probably be best practice to have the number of squares, number of quads be very similar to the number of triangle slash quads that we have in the original mesh. If we go too low, it's not going to have enough to do anything with. If, if there's too many, then it's just we don't need that much detail. So we can use a component called from Pufferfish called uh, Mesh Statistics. 
And what this will do is it'll tell us the number of faces that our mesh has when we plug that mesh in. Again, we're not using the mesh edges for anything. We're just visualizing with that. So we'll plug the mesh into mesh statistics. This has a lot of outputs here for different statistics of the mesh. The one we care about, though, is going to be the second one down called face count. So that'll tell us how many faces, how many triangles slash quads do we have. In my case, I have just above 1,300. So we should probably also shoot to have 1,300 quads in the quadri mesh. So we can see the first input for the quadri mesh settings is going to be the target count. So how many quads do we want? By default, it's 1,000. Um, but we should plug in the face output into the target count input. And now this will tell the quadri mesh component to try to uh, aim for 1,300 quads. And then a couple other things that might be important on the quadri mesh setting, depending on what uh, quality you want. But these second to the second and third, the adaptive size and the ad adaptive count. What this will do uh, if we turn these on is it'll put more quads in more curvature dense areas. So if we have a really curvy surface, it's not just going to do one quad across that surface. It'll do a lot more to kind of better define that surface. So we can turn these on uh, just to show. So we'll need a Boolean toggle. Because as we can see, the adaptive count by default is false. So we can infer from that that it's asking for a true or false value, either to turn on or turn off the adaptive count. So we can plug in that and just set that to true to turn on the adaptive count. So it'll make more quads where needed. And then in order to uh, refine the adaptive count, we can also choose an adaptive size. And this is anywhere from 0 to 100. Uh, we can see by the description here what that does. You can go somewhere in the middle. Uh, I usually do like 25 or 50. Um, it might not make a huge difference in our surfaces because they're not that curvy unless you really went wild with the curve and made something crazy, then it might be helpful. But it's just good to know about those two settings. They're, they're pretty important. So once we have that plugged in, we can plug in the settings into the settings input of the quadri mesh. This is very similar to Dendro, how it also needs settings to work. Um, but once we have the settings in the quadri mesh, then we can also feed it our mesh from the mesh B rep from earlier. And this will take a second or two, depending how many faces you're asking for, uh, and give us a result there. So with that, there's a lot of wires. Let me try to organize this a little bit. Yeah, what's that? I'm on run of six, and it only looks like I have simple reverb. Oh, OK. Um, good to know. Um, it's called simple. You said it's called simple remesh? That's what it says. Hmm. The only remesh options I have are remesh by color and simple remesh. Okay, can you take a screenshot of the simple remesh and just put it in the Discord yeah. and like the questions or something? Um, I'll see if it's if they like updated it for okay. Rhino 8 or not, like just the name of it or something. Um, but we'll, yeah, we'll get to the Rhino 6 like process okay. with that in a second. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, so once you've done the remesh, and again, we'll do the quad remesh right after this, but we can compare the two mesh edge operations. So visualizing the mesh edges from quad remesh, we get this beautiful collection of, uh, of edges. It's all very neatly organized versus our original mesh um, was kind of all over the place. There was nothing uniform about this original one, but the quad remesh, super nice now. So hopefully that's working for everyone with the quadri mesh. Um, yeah, let's take a look at. Um, did you share a photo of the component? Yeah, that works. Okay, so it's going to work the same as the triangle remesh. Um, so you should just be able to follow along the same way. So for this one, the only thing that's important is uh, instead of the face count for anyone with other remesh options that's asking for length, the edge length is going to be what's important. Um, in this case, again, we're not too sure what the original edge lengths were. Um, these are the original edges. We could just kind of guess, um, which might be the quickest way. 
Uh, but if you wanted to be more specific about it, you could um, you could deconstruct the mesh and then just take an average of all of the, or actually we can just use this mesh edges and take an average of all the mesh edge lengths. Um, or the more simple thing, which I'll just do now, is we can just use a slider and you can go pretty low 0.01 to maybe like five or something. Um, and we'll figure out like what edge length looks good. I'm just going to start somewhere in the middle, like two and a half. But if we plug in that length and then also pass it our geometry, okay. Once it returns to us, then we can also preview what this mesh edge output looks like. Okay. So the shape I drew is very big, so 2.5 is a very, very small number, um, which I'm not sure what it is for you, but if you, it just get, like frozen or? It says um, solution exception index is outside bounds, like the box is actually. Hmm. Um, interesting. And it was just the mesh from the mesh we wrapped the geometry and the yep. slider to length. Hmm. Um, just doesn't do anything. Interesting. Does anyone else have Rhino 6 in here or on Zoom? Yeah, I'm having the same problem. The same problem? Okay. Yeah. Um, that is weird. I mean, we shouldn't technically need this. Like, it's not going to not work without it. It just might look a little bit different than if you have one of the remesh settings to clean up kind of the geometry, sure. but it'll all still it'll still work. So, um, so yeah, Camden, I think oh, we got a chat here too. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. So if you can't see the remesh in Rhino Six, very weird problem, but we can continue without it because we don't we don't technically need it. It's just a nice thing to have. Um, so come back to Kangaroo. Let's see. Okay, so. With kangaroo, uh, we don't need any of these. The main thing, as I said, is going to be the solver. So we can use, let's use the bouncy solver. It'll be a little bit more fun to see the simulation. So we'll grab that bouncy solver. And all we need to see now is whatever your final mesh component is. We'll have that on one side and the bouncy solver on the other side of the canvas. And we're going to fill up the in-between with all the rules that make up our system for how we want this thing to work. So get that on there. Um, before we start adding goals, uh, we'll want to fulfill two inputs for this, mainly the reset and then the on, both of those inputs. So the reset is going to be like a button. If we want the simulation to reset, we can hit it. Uh, the on, as it says, is like an on and off. So if we want the simulation to stop, we can turn it off. If we want it to play, we can turn that on. So in order to do that, uh, you might have already figured it out, but we'll need a button for the reset button, and then we'll need a Boolean toggle for the on or off setting. So we'll just grab both of those. And we can wire the button into reset and wire the toggle into on. And that'll just set us up uh, for the solver to start. We'll want to make sure the toggle is set at false. If it's set at true, it'll just like keep running with the stuff we plug in. Uh, bless you, which we don't want until we actually have the goals all set up. So we'll just leave it at false for now. So we have a lot of goals. Um, one organizational thing, just to keep all of the goals and everything organized, uh, because they'll all be going into this one goal object input. So even if we have 100 different goals, they're all going to go straight in here. One thing I like to do to keep that clean is to use this component called entwine. It's like merge, but it puts things on different branches, which is a little bit more organized for this, for this use case. So we'll run that into goal objects, and we'll just have this set up and ready to start accepting all of our goal inputs as we work through those. Um, so there's a lot of possibility with Kangaroo. If you're using this for any other projects, um, like I recommend to play around with different goals or maybe look at some YouTube videos for the certain thing you're trying to do. Uh, in this sense, we're going to be looking at like a fabric simulation kind of. 
Um, even though it is a roof, it's, it's mainly like a simulation of fabric mesh and edges and all that. So it's very specific and we'll only use a couple of the goals out of all that we have. But um, let's see, the main thing that we can start with is actually giving ourselves some anchor points on the surface so um, the mesh doesn't just fly away. Hmm. Actually, it might be fun if it flies away first and then we'll get to that. So in the goal on, um, or sorry, in the mesh section, we should have one called vertex loads. Um, this is going to give a gravity value to every single vertex on the mesh. So we'll grab that. Um, the strength here is going to be the, the vector and the strength of how much gravity we give it. So right now it's trying to pull it down at negative 0.1, which that doesn't really make much sense until we see what happens with that. So what we can do is plug our mesh from either the mesh to BREP or the quadri mesh into there. And then we can wire this. Um, I'm just going to wire this into the 0, 1 input, and we'll see why in a second. Plug it into 0, 1. Okay, so now if we zoom out in, in Rhino a little bit, we can hit the reset button to reset the simulation to make sure all of our goals are updated. When you hit the reset, we can hit the on button. And we should see all of the points when you turn it to true, just fall straight down. And we can hit the reset button without like turning the simulation off. We can just leave it on true and hit the reset button and the points will come back up. And then they'll fall down, they'll fall down forever again because we have nothing else set up as a goal, only gravity. So hopefully that's working for everyone. Very simple, so it should. Okay, so now we can see we have one goal set up, but you can never really only ever use one single goal. Uh, we kind of need a goal that's going in one direction and then a goal restricting it going in an opposite direction to keep things like stable. So we have gravity pulling things down. We could also change this in our sense because we're trying to make a roof to make it go up. So instead of negative 0.1, we could do positive 0.1. You can do that with a slider or a panel. Or you can put in like 100 or something and just see it go up at like light speed. Up to you. I'm going to stick with 0.1. And once we reset and hit it back to true, it should go now in the opposite direction. So now gravity is going up into space. Okay, so if that's working, we'll give it a, an opposite goal. So maybe we'll say some of the points on the edge should stay anchored to the ground, like if we were staking a tent, keep those on the ground, everything else has gravity. So let's put that together. Um, the easiest hey, way to do that with our setup is to take this original curve that we have going around the boundary. We can divide this into a certain number of points, and then we can say wherever those points are, just keep the mesh tacked down to the ground at those positions. So in order to do that, um, we can divide the curve, divide curve, and then we can set any number of points to divide this by. Um, so we'll grab that. We can plug our curve in. And if you want to add a value, you can add a slider into n. But it comes with 10 by default. So if you want to stick with 10, feel free or you can change this to any number you want, up to you. So now we should see a certain number of points around the outside of that curve. Okay, so with that set up, um, we can grab a anchor component, and this anchor component from Kangaroo uh, will take a point to anchor down, a target location to anchor it to, which is op optional. As it says, if it's left empty, it'll just use the initial location. So we can leave that blank. And then a strength, which every goal component in Kangaroo has a strength value to it. So once we start adding multiple goals, we can change the strength on some of them. So say we want um, the gravity be to be super strong, but the anchoring to be super weak, we could do that. And then it might like break or something and be more dynamic. 
up to you. Um, but by default, all the strengths are pretty similar. Um, so we have points, we have an anchor, but one thing that we'll keep in mind is that since we're simulating this mesh, we'll want all of the values that we simulate with to be from that mesh. So these points that we just created are not from the mesh, they're from that initial curve. So what we'll have to do is actually find points on the mesh that are pretty in much in those locations from the divide. So we've done this before. Um, we can do it with a closest point. Just the singular one, not the plural. So closest point, we'll find a closest point on the mesh, and then we can actually have some value from the mesh itself to anchor down. Because if we anchor these points, they're not part of the mesh at all. It's not going to make any sense to do that. So we'll find points from our mesh input, the input that's going into Kangaroo. Um, and we'll have to find the vertices from it. The way to do that would be to deconstruct the mesh. Deconstructing it will give us the vertices, faces, colors, normals of the mesh. If we plug that together. Um, we should see the same point grid come up that we saw with the solver. Um, both of them are just seeing the points that are on that mesh. And now we can figure out where our closest points are. So again, with the closest point, we'll start with the points to search from. So we know that we have the points from the division that are going to be our searching points. So these are the ones we want to keep down. So we want to search from these two points on the mesh. So looking at the inputs, the points to search from, the starting points can be the divide curve. And then looking at the C input, the cloud, these are the clouds of points to do the searching within. So that's the points that we want to find. And we want to find points on this deconstruct mesh. So we can use the vertices from that to um, be the searching points. So we can plug that into C. And now if we toggle just between the divide curve, let me preview these off real quick. The divide curve in the closest point, you can see it changes slightly as it finds the point closest to the divide curve. So it didn't change much, but now we actually have points from the actual mesh to use. So once we have the points, we can use the points as an anchor. So we'll plug that into the P input, which are the points to do the anchoring on. So that should tell Kangaroo to keep those points where they are and not to move them at all. So with that, um, we can run the anchor out. We're going to put that in the same input as all the other goals. So if you plug it into 0, 1, we'll also plug it into 0, 1. Make sure you hold shift when you're doing this to run all the wires into the same input. And once you've done this, if we reset the simulation and play it now, we can see that um, there are some points that are missing as it goes up. But this isn't too helpful uh, because seeing a lot of points isn't the same as seeing a surface or some piece of fabric or a mesh that tells us a lot more about what's happening. So, RJ? Yeah, Joe, what's up? What if ours isn't flying up. Uh, Where is also, there, I can perhaps? barely hear you, Joe, which is interesting. Oh, you can't. That's so weird. Um, I can kind of hear you. Let me, um, let me see what's happening. Is it better now? Yeah. Hmm. What if it isn't flying up when we reset? What is it doing? Nothing. It's just sitting on the ground. Um, you have it set to true? Oh. Uh, oh, uh, no. That was it. OK, cool. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, OK, so now that we have points, we want to actually see the mesh um, of this. Let me stop this. So this is why I've kept this first input open. Um, what this will do is we'll actually be able to plug our mesh in and see the mesh on like this mesh. We'll see it at the output of the solver, so the simulated mesh. In order to do that, we can use this component 
that's also in the main tab with all the other solvers called show. Now what this will do is it'll pass through whatever geometry we want through the solver into the output so we can actually see if we're putting in a mesh, we also want to see a mesh coming out. Um, so again, everything is working from this mesh component. So we'll run that into the show because we want to see this mesh and we want to see what's been simulated to it. So we'll put that, put that into show, wire that into zero, zero. And now basically what we've done, and the reason why I didn't use a merge component is because a merge will just put everything on the same list, um, which isn't really helpful if we have the show along with all the simulation data. So if we put the show on zero and then all of the goals on one, we can parse this out on the other side and just cut off all of the goals and only see the mesh. So in order to do that, um, we'll look at this solver here and we have the out as list and this is um, everything coming out of the solver. Um, so what we can do is use a explode tree. And what this is going to do is it's going to take, we, with the entwine, we put things on two separate lists. So if we come on the output, we can explode this into two separate lists again. And we can just take the mesh with the mesh component. And this will give us the actual mesh that we want to see. So in doing that, I'll leave this up. I'm just going to preview off everything else that's here. So we don't need it anymore. We just want to see the mesh that's being simulated. Um, and if you've done this correctly, when we hit reset and hit true again, um, everything will still go up into space, but we should see these little triangles being stuck down to the bottom as it moves away. I'm going to turn my uh, vertex load speed down a little bit so we can see this a little bit slower. So we have positive gravity in this case, and we have an anchor point. Um, but the edges, um, which let me do. Let's actually look at the edges that are coming out. So we can see as this is simulating, all the edges up on the top here have not changed in length, but the edges on this big triangle are getting really, really long, um, which is not great. What we would want to happen is all of the edges pretty much stay the same length the entire time, but we just want to see the gravity effect on that. Um, so again, having these two different edge lengths is not helping us too much, but there's a goal to solve that. Um, we should have a goal called uh, edge lengths in the goals mesh tab. Um, this one we can actually set the edge of every or the length of every edge in a mesh. So we'll grab that. So this one we can see we have a mesh input and we have a length factor input. So the length factor is not actually asking for a length. It's just asking for a multiplication value um, of each edge length. So if we want them to stay the same, we can set it at one. If we want them to grow in size, we can set it something above one. If we want it to get smaller, like contract, we can set it below one. So, okay, let's again take the mesh uh, component. We'll plug that in to the mesh for the edge length. And then we'll give it a length factor. So we can use anything around one. Um, one is going to be like pretty much no change around that will be different. So I'm just going to go from point one to two to give us some room to play with. You can go at to whatever number you want though. Um, just know if you, if you do something crazy, it, it might go crazy. So I'm just gonna keep mine around one for the time being. Okay, so with that wired in, um, you could probably guess what the next step is, but we're just gonna plug the edge length goal into the same input as everything else, zero, one. And once we've done that, we can reset again and toggle on the simulation. Um, my gravity is super slow, so let's turn that back up a little bit. 
And we can see that start to fill out its shape. Um, don't worry if uh, your mesh component is turning red, that uh, does not matter. One thing too is we can touch this while it's simulating. So if you want to poke it, we can do that as well, which is kind of fun. Um, we looked at the solvers already. We looked at show. There's one other that I haven't touched on yet, which is grab. Um, grab lets us like actually grab the particles in the scene, so any of the points that are in the simulation. So we can use this as another goal, pretty much. We don't have to plug anything into it. Uh, it's on by default. We could change the range if you want to, but you don't have to worry about that right now. We'll wire that into the same goal as everything else. We want to make sure that the solver is on so we can see the points that are actually being simulated. Um, Kangaroo mostly works with simulating point locations. It's not actually simulating a mesh. I mean, kind of, but it's mostly the points. So once we can see the points, we can reset the simulation, turn it back on, and then while it's simulating, we can go grab points on the mesh and like move them around. So it's not really going to do much because it's always going to go back to its stable state. Um, but say you were making like a cloth simulation for uh, for clothing, maybe in Grasshopper, and you wanted to pull pieces to fit on your mannequin better, um, you could really easily do that here. So you could kind of adjust garments if, if that's something you're into. Um, or if we had some kind of uh, like collision mesh, say we wanted to simulate this around a massive boulder on the inside and it wasn't like fitting around the boulder correctly, you could like pull the surface to kind of fit better. So a lot of things you could do if you want to adjust it. And if you're getting the same issue I'm getting where you, like, you have a, a box, um, we can also change the range on this. So instead of a very small distance to grab points, you could give it optional, but a larger distance to grab points. And now it should be a lot easier to grab stuff if you're having that issue. But yeah, is that working for everyone? Pretty much. Okay. Um, are you plugging in something other than a mesh to any of these goals? Okay, yeah, let me come take a look at it then. It's saying that on the solver. Um, at the very end, <clears throat> where the mesh is. Oh, is the mesh one? Right? <coughs> yeah, at the very end. I don't think I can do it. Okay. Yeah, mine is like, I didn't get like a, a bunch of old boxes. Oh, okay, if you turn on the box, it's all the way to the end. Yeah, it's like your plan then, it's it would say. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a good question though. So let me talk about it here. But um, that mesh component at the very end, if you see this turning red, don't worry about it. Um, what I'm using it for here is kind of a filter for meshes. So it's technically having an error that the data is failing to convert to a mesh. Um, but all I'm using it for is to extract a mesh from this list. So what it's doing is it's only like if we put a data on the end here. Uh, it's only letting meshes come out, and it's not letting any of the curves come with it, um, which it's a very improper use of this component for sure. But there's not really a better way to filter out meshes from larger sets of data, unless you knew like what the index of the mesh was. Um, so it's it's a very rough way to do it, but yeah.
Okay, so that's all working, so that's cool. Um, one thing we could do as well is we could change this edge length factor if you want it to be more inflated, more of a circus tent vibe, maybe. Um, and you can do this all while it's simulating as well. If you change any of the inputs, like the curve or the mesh, then you have to reset. But if you're changing any of the settings on the goals themselves, you can update that in real time. Um, so we could go from positive um, gravity to negative gravity and watch it fall back through and catch itself. Nice. Cool. So play around with that. Um, this one's, yeah, usually a pretty fun one. Uh, there's a lot of other goals you can play with too. Um, if your mesh is maybe a little like messy, like not ironed out, there's a component called uh, smooth that you could use. Um, we could also maybe give this wind at the same time. I don't know. Curious to see what that would do. Okay, so there's our tent in a tornado, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure why you would need the win, but it is another goal that you could use. But there's a, there's a lot of stuff here for simulating, um, not just architecture things, but a lot of different stuff. So, yeah. Okay, but um, yeah, feel free to keep playing with that. We'll move on to the second tutorial now, which is six, so it's pretty good. Um, this next one is more of a um, kind of sculptural body architecture type thing. Um, so I have these other two inputs down here. Um, which are another mannequin and a B-rep, um, kind of a boundary around the head to give us some volume. So we've made necklaces before. We'll kind of make a shoulder, neck, headdress thing today with kangaroo. Um, and we looked at meshes and surfaces. We'll look at simulating curves now uh, and see how to do something with them. Okay, so with this one, we have our character in the middle here. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the person should be inside of the box. Um, we don't need to preview the box on, but yeah, the box should be in the person. We'll use the box as kind of like a boundary. So I'll do this quick sketch of what we'll plan to do. We have the person, we have the box, and we're going to make a sculpture within this box. Um, so what we're basically going to do is we're going to make a random kind of curve around the head. So we'll start by setting points just in this box, and then we will connect the points with some kind of curve. And then we can simulate this curve kind of growing and moving to make a more uh, organic, ornate kind of sculpture. Um, just a fun way to play with some of the other settings in Kangaroo. So that's what we'll do. And we'll build that up now. So we have this B rep here. Um, the first thing we'll do is populate some points. We've done this before with some of the Voronoi tutorials, but 
uh, we can populate 3D to fill in the box with some points. So we'll do that. We'll see some points around the head. Um, we don't want too many points. Uh, again, it's up to you, whatever number you want. I'm going to use a slider from 1 to 100 just to, to give us some range. And just put some number in. So with the points in a box, um, what we're going to do is we're going to draw a curve through all these points. And I don't know about you, but I think symmetry looks a lot nicer when making things in 3D. Uh, up to you though, you might like the asymmetry, but in this case, uh, something we can play with is we can use a component from Pufferfish, which everyone should have, called Mirror Cut Points. There's a lot of tools in Pufferfish for making symmetry. Um, a lot of them have to do with the mirror cut and then insert type of geometry afterwards. But you can see a lot of them here. We can mirror cut meshes, poly surface, surface points, uh, curves. Basically what this is going to do, it's going to take our you know, list of points, say we have some random number of points, it's going to draw a line down wherever we put a plane and just mirror everything over to the other side to give us a symmetrical set of geometry, in this case points. Um, so we can set, start by setting up our mirror plane. In this case, since the person is facing this direction, we can look down at our little compass at the bottom and see that the plane that intersects the body this way is going to be the YZ plane, which we'll cut straight back through. So we can use YZ as that mirror plane. If we zoom in at the origin, we can see it shows up down there. So we'll plug that into the plane input. And then we can give it our points to do the symmetricalization operation onto. And I'm just going to hide the populate 3D because we don't need to see that anymore. Um, if we look at our scene now, we can see that our point set has been mirrored across that YZ axis. So now we have this shape. So on that, we can connect this with a curve to start making our structure. Um, we can use an interpolated curve. There's two main types of curves in Grasshopper. We're either doing a polyline or we're doing a mathematically perfect curve. Um, in this case, interpolate, or you could use a NURBS curve, something different, but interpolate's pretty easy. This will just make a very smooth connection between all points that we give it. So if we use our mirrored points output as the vertices for this interpolated curve, you can see we start to get a pattern in Rhino of this curve. Just plugging that in. One thing to note, though, is it's not perfectly symmetrical because we're not finishing off this curve. There's a little gap here between the last point and the first point. We can fix that, though, by changing the periodic value. Right now it's false, so it's not creating a full loop. We can use a Boolean toggle, setting that to true to turn on that component and actually make it finish the curve. So now it's a perfectly looping curve. So now we have the start of this kind of organic randomness sculpture around the head. Um, so we can start to simulate this with kangaroo to make it grow and expand and change shape a little bit. First thing to do though, before we start with that is, again, with kangaroo, we can simulate discrete things. So we can simulate edges, we can simulate points, meshes, things like that. Uh, but we can't simulate B reps. We can't simulate perfect curves because that's just like a mathematical equation of a curve. It's not discrete objects that we can play with. So right now this interpolated curve is just that it's a curve, it's, it's not anything broken up. So we can divide this into curve segments and then we can simulate those segments and we can play with those a lot better. So to start doing that, um, we can divide, just like we did before, divide the curve into a set number of points so we're getting closer to things we can use with kangaroo. 
So we can divide this curve. Dividing it by the default of 10 is not a lot of points though. We'll have a very rough curve. So if we divide it by some high number, say 100, 200, this will give us a lot more points within that curve. We'll have a pretty dense list now. Um, so we can see all those curves there. We can put a lot of small segments in between. So we can still keep the resolution. At this scale, we're not gonna see too much change, but with straight line segments, we can simulate those a lot better with Kangaroo. So in order to construct those very straight line segments, we can use the other kind of curve tool called the poly line. This will connect all the points together again, but it's gonna give us straight segments in between every single point. Uh, the reason why we did interpolate before polyline is because if we did a polyline on the original set of points, we'd have a very rough, jagged thing. Um, interpolate's just gonna get those smoother connections. So we can break up the interpolate into a polyline. I'm gonna preview all of this off. Again, with this one, we have the polyline is not closed. So we can just use our true value from earlier, wire that in, that'll close off the curve. Now we have a fully uh, closed curve here. So with this polyline, we have straight segments, but they're all joined together. They're not discrete segments still, it's just one curve. So we can break this up into individual segments with the explode component. And what this will do is it'll just break up a curve at all of its kinks. So every place that we put a point on that original curve, it'll break it there, uh, which in turn is gonna give us perfectly straight line segments going around this entire path. And you can see with the details saying they're all line-like curves. So that's, that's what we like to see, they're all, they're all straight. Okay, so this is good. We have the lines that we want to simulate with, so we can start on our kangaroo operations now. So all we'll need is this explode component, and then we'll grab a step solver this time. We'll try a different one. I'll just put this on the right side. Okay, so as we saw before, we'll need a reset button and we'll need a Boolean toggle. Actually, I take that back. We need none of these for this solver. My bad. Um, the step solver is different. Uh, this will give us individual frames and we can animate those frames with a slider this time. So everything is handled with this animate input. If you look at the details, it'll tell you what it does. But basically, if we give it the number zero, it's going to reset the simulation. If we give it any other number, it'll start making frames of a simulation. So we can use a slider from zero to 100, maybe. I don't know how many we'll use. Uh, it's up to us how many frames we want. And we can just wire that into animate. And then that takes away the orange color. Now we're ready to go. Okay, so just like we did before um, with the goals, we can use an entwine again. So we can keep everything separated. So we got clean data. And then same thing on the other side, we can use that explode tree. And then we'll come back to that. That'll just give us our data at the end. Okay, so with this setup, we can start giving our goals to the simulation. Um, important things here is we want to control the line length just like we controlled the mesh edge length with the last simulation. Um, so we'll control that. We'll not want this line to intersect uh, the mannequin we have here, so we don't want it to go inside of the mesh of the mannequin. And then on top of that, we don't want the curve to intersect with itself, so kind of loop in on itself. 
So we'll control all three of those things with some goals here. So the first one, uh, since we have lines this time, we'll come to the line section. And there's one here that can control the length of the line. So we'll use that. So length line, very similar to the mesh edge length one that we used in the last simulation. This one though, um, it's actually asking for a numerical length. So an actual length that we want it to be at. So we'll have to solve for that. Um, it's not as nice as the multiplication value last time. But we'll get to that. Um, we'll also not want the curve to collide on itself. So we can use a sphere collide, which will basically draw a sphere around every point in the simulation. And then all of those sphere shapes will not intersect with each other, keeping our points apart so they don't like roll up into a rat's nest. And then last thing that we'll want is we don't want the points to collide with the mesh itself. So we can use a solid point collide, which is going to keep a set of points, as it says, inside or outside of a mesh. So we have these three goals here. And with the goals, again, we can wire those all into um, the first input of the entwine. So we have that all set up. Okay, so we have the line segments from the explode. Uh, we got two outputs here, segments and vertices. We don't need the vertices, but we do need the segments. So we have these segments, which we can use as the line that we'll do the simulation on. So we have that, we can just plug that in. But we will have to figure out what the length of these lines are. Right now, I'm, I'm not sure what they are, but we can figure it out with a couple components. First thing we can do is use a length component to measure the length of every single line segment. So we'll find the length, then we can take the average of the length because again, they're all pretty much the same length. And then we can use that average as our value for the length there. So we'll use the segments as the curve input to find the length. We can take the average of all these lengths. So it looks like they're pretty similar by default but uh, we don't need an individual length for every single line. We just need one that's kind of controlling everything. So if we take an average, we'll go from a list of, in my case, 200 different values to one averaged value, which will be good enough for what we're doing here. So just like we did with the last simulation, we can control the length of these lines with the multiplication value. In this sense, we had to do that measuring ourselves for this component, but we can still use a multiplication to say if we want to scale or shrink this line, you know, giving it a value above or below one. So with multiplication, I mean, it works like how you'd think. We're going to multiply the average value by a slider. I'm going to go from 0.1 to 2, but we can start just at a regular value of 1, meaning that uh, the line should stay the same length when we simulate. So we can wire that multiplication into the length of the line. And now we're telling it, in my case, that we want to keep all the lines around 32 units long. So they'll all get that value. Um, so that's good for the length of the line. If we did the animation right now, Nothing should change, which, yeah, nothing is changing, because um, we haven't added, ha have not added any forces to it. Um, one thing you could do is move this slider down a little bit, and then as we do the animate, you should see it shrink a little bit, because I put this number uh, below one just slightly. But it only shrinks so much until it stops. So we got a little bit of movement there. And we'll build up the rest of it and then simulate again to see it all working. So the next thing we should fulfill is this sphere collide. Um, this one is going to be, it's going to use points 
and keep those points away from each other based on a radius value, which is going to be this R input here. Um, we have points from earlier. We have the divide curve. So we could use those as the points to use in this operation. And then in turn with this multiplication, we also have the radius value. Um, if we have a line of 33 units long and we have two points, if each of these has a radius of that, then it'll keep the points away from each other, which will be perfect. Um, so we can just use this multiplication value as the radius there. And that should fulfill that. Um, the last thing though is a solid point collide. This is gonna be the mesh of our figure that's in the scene itself. So we'll have to zoom out a little bit just to see that original mesh just from the beginning. So the mesh of that person there. We'll use this as the solid input. So the second one down, we'll wire the mesh into there. Um, and it's saying this component, it can be either a BREP or a mesh as an input here for a solid. So we can use either of those. Uh, I gave you a mesh so that that'll work just fine. We'll also need to know which points to keep away from the mesh. And if we're using the points from the divide curve for the sphere collide, we can use those same points for this component as well. Uh, last thing here, we just want to tell the points to either stay inside or outside of the mesh. So if we read this statement, it says, if false, the points will be kept outside. Um, by default, we can see it is false. So that's great. Uh, that'll all work. But if you were wanting to contain points like inside a certain volume or something, you could just flip that to true. So just keep that in mind. But for today, we'll keep it as false. So we don't have to do anything. Okay, so now that we've done that, um, we can move this number slider down a little bit, um, which will tell the simulation to contract all of the curves. And if we do a simulate there, we'll see them kind of contract and get smushed around on top of the input mesh of that character person. So is it simulating for everyone or is it just not doing anything for anyone? It is at least moving right now. Cool, cool, cool. And you can make that multiplication value, whatever number you want. The smaller you make it, the faster it's going to shrink into the mesh. Um, if you go any bigger, then it's just going to go away from the mesh, which isn't too much what we're trying to do. So I'm going to keep it like 0.5 maybe. Yeah, that should do it. Another thing to mention here, uh, in animating, we also have this option for sub iterations, which is new for this component. We didn't have this last time. But by default, the sub iterations here is 10. So for every frame we step up, it's going to basically do 10 passes and then show you the result of that. If we want to see a more refined result, we could lower that number. So we could set it, the sub iterations to be one maybe. So if we do a simulation now, we have much more refined control. Basically, it's not shrinking as fast as it was before. We're seeing more of those in-between frames. So last time I could go to about 20 frames and it would stop, now I'm up at 100 and it's still playing. So just a thing to keep in mind, uh, you could have this number be whatever you want though. I'll touch on the other inputs for the solvers. These are all consistent with the other solvers. We're not gonna change them today, but um, the first one here, the tolerance. So the tolerance means if the, if the movement of all of the points combined returns less than this very small number, then it's gonna stop the simulation. Basically nothing is happening anymore. So there's no reason to keep the simulation running. It'll stop it automatically. Um, which in this simulation we might get to in the last one, it would run for much longer because there's just a lot more going on. The other two, so momentum, so how much weight the points carry as they move. Um, and then the damping, so if we make this number really low, the points will kind of fizzle out a lot quicker. But right now it's, it's super close to one. Um, if it was one, the points would move forever, um, but it's right below that, so they will have a slight decrease in speed over time. Um, but again, we're not changing any of those today. Okay, so now that we have the simulation running, what will be interesting to see is a collection of all of the frames together uh, to kind of see uh, maybe like a stop motion of this 
uh, of these curves moving. So we can play with a component um, that'll track the process of the simulation. And we'll do that in one second. Um, if we come to the output of the solver here, there's a lot in this output, a lot of nulls, a lot of different things. So before we start using this to make a final mesh out of, we we'll want to clean it up first. So we've used this before, this clean tree component can come in pretty handy. If we want to get rid of some bad data, in this case, we we'll want to get rid of the null values, which it should do by default. So if we just plug that into the tree input down here at the bottom, you'll see coming out we have 200 lines, which is what we started with. We also started with 200 lines, so that's nice. Um, all the lines, though, are separate. They're still discrete parts, which works for the simulation, but in our sense, we we'll want to combine them all back together into one singular line, and we can use a join curve component to do that. That'll just take all the segments and join them at their closest points, kind of like welding when we were doing welding last week or two weeks ago before spring break with the meshes. So we can wire that into the curves and then coming out, we should see one polyline curve, which is just gonna be the single curve of everything. I'm just gonna turn all this off. Don't need that. So now as we simulate, we should see that, that curve in there, which is great. So in order to track the progress of this curve over time, um, there's a component in Grasshopper called the Data Recorder. Um, what this one does, it basically, as it says, it's capturing all the data you give to it over time. So it'll save a state every time it's being updated, so every time it receives new data. So we can grab that. It's a very simple recorder. A very simple component. Uh, we have a record or stop recording button, just like a camera, and then a clear memory button on the other side. So if we run the curves into the data recorder, I might put my sub iterations up a little higher so we don't see as much, but if we start the recording here, so the red light is on, it is recording. And then we start to simulate the solver. Uh, we'll see all of the steps captured in this recorder. So we can see the progress over time of the curve as it moves. Kind of the history of what's happening. So if you turn your sub iterations down really low, we'll get a denser set of data here. So if I put this back to one, yeah, question? Um, if it's jagged and crazy looking, then um, one of the settings might just be really high or really low, like, uh, or your divide curve was super high, so there's a lot of movement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so again, the lower the step solver is, the more dense this uh, kind of this graph of our history of simulation is going to be. So if I put this maybe back to five, clear the data list, go back, clear it again. Now we can see all those steps in there. So this is just a, what was that? Is there a yeah. Yeah. Uh, like if you're continue kind of going until mm -hmm. it's like done, does it get Possibly. Everyone's simulation is different, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, it all depends what your settings are, what your input geometry is, all that. So, um, I mean, you can change a lot of this different stuff. One thing you could do maybe is cut the radius in half um, because maybe some of the spheres are overlapping. Uh, I'm not sure. You could also change the strength up. Like, if it's getting really jagged and the lines are kind of touching themselves, Maybe the strength of the collide is too low and it's just letting the points actually intersect when they shouldn't be. So you can turn that strength up as well. Yeah. Okay, so with that, there's one other thing I want to do, but I have to give you this, uh, this component.
Okay, so if, if you grab this uh, poll curve to mesh component from Discord, just go ahead and download that one. Uh, open up another Grasshopper window. Okay, so I'll give you all a second to do that and kind of explain what's going to happen here. Um, this component that we have, so this is a C sharp component. Basically what it's doing is it'll take any curve and any mesh and it'll pull that curve directly onto the mesh itself. Um, there's a lot of ways to pull curves around. We have project components by default. But uh, all these project components, they either project onto surfaces or they only project a single direction, or you have to set up many different vectors to, to direct points in a certain way. Um, this C sharp script is going to do um, all that for us. It's very simple. If you want to look inside of the component and see what it's doing, you definitely can. It's not much, um, but it's just a component that I have not found in any uh, plugins, so we're doing it here like this. If anyone knows C Sharp, you can also write stuff in here if you're up for it, but I barely know, so would not recommend it. So if you want to see the inside, you could edit it. Uh, if not, we'll just leave it as it is right here. But what we'll do with this is we'll use it to kind of get, just like we did with the shortest walk, we want some like skin tight piece to sit on the model. Um, to actually give us a base for the sculpture to like rest on. It's not just totally random. So we can plug the curves in. And then we'll also use the mesh of this input figure again. So go back and you can either copy this component or just wire it all the way over here, whichever one you want. We'll just use that, um, the mannequin that I gave y'all. Okay, so if we plug those both in the curve and the mesh, we'll get a pattern on the surface of the mesh itself at all of the closest locations from the curve. Um, so taking our kind of random sculpture piece uh, and actually making it talk with the input uh, geometry that we gave it, so kind of the site in this case. So is that working for everyone? Um, how do you get the the block from the file you just gave us into the one we're working in? Then? Yeah, good question. So this is the one I gave you. If you copy this, so I'm just doing Control C to copy it, and then if you come back to the file we were working on, if you look at like your data recorder section, instead of doing Control C, if you do Control Shift C, then it's going to paste it. Oh, wait, never mind. Control Shift V to paste. That'll just paste it where we're looking. So that should be the easiest way to get the component into the file that we're working on. If you just do Control V, it's going to paste it at the top left of the canvas. So you just have to zoom out and go grab it um, and just paste it right there. But if you do Control you. Shift V, yeah, it'll go to where we're looking. Yeah, we could also rename this. Okay, so if that's working for everyone, we can go ahead and finish up this one here by just making it something solid, something we can 3D print as always. And we have two, two curve lists, one from the data record, one from the C sharp component. Uh, we can use Dendro again to make it solid. Uh, we can merge the two curve lists together to start. Um, so we'll take the curves from the data recorder and then also the A output from the C-sharp script. Um, the actual out 
is just going to tell us about any errors, but the A has all the geometry in it. So we've got the curves there. Uh, so now with this merge, we should have all of the curve sets in the same list. And we can pipe all these together with Dendro at the same time. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> I saw like three confused faces to using a merge. So I was just like. <laughs> just trying to figure out what. You like missed the one part with the mesh mannequin. So we're trying to figure out how you, like what mesh is that. Oh, it, it's just the, just the, it's just, just the original one. <laughs> yeah, I copied. Oh, so okay. you could, you could drag this all the way over and do it, which also works. I just did this so you know what's happening. Um, you like miss that one part. So <laughs> I see, I see. <laughs> yeah, and little tip here too on that, um, just to keep things organized, like if I was to do that again, um let's see having a component that just says mesh is only so helpful like we're not sure what this like if we had five of these what you can do though is you can come you can right click on here and you can change the title of this to be whatever you want um and when you do that uh, if you hit the little paint bucket here it's going to change it from the icon to what we wrote so you can actually like kind of comment your uh your input components um, so you kind of know what's in there. One thing you can do. You could also leave panels, you know, just kind of a tangent on organization, or you could leave a scribble as well. Just different ways to kind of name different parts. Or since we're doing that, you could also group it and then you could name it as well. Just a bunch of different ways to leave comments and name stuff. So. And we could also change the group, and now it's like blobby. So that's cool. Uh, but we don't we don't need any of that. It's just fun. Okay, so now that we have all the curves in the merge, if this is working for everyone, uh, we'll we'll do the last step, and we're going to use Dendro again for this to make the final mesh. Um, does anyone remember how to set up Dendro? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, every time we do Dendro, we'll do settings. And we'll uh, give it a voxel resolution setting. So I always do a slider from 0.01 to 1 to give us a range. Again, never start at the lowest setting. We'll always start at the highest setting so we don't crash our computer. And then with that, um, since we have curves, we can use the curve to volume, which will basically make it into a pipe. Um, again, we kind of do this every class, but if you have questions, let me know. Um, yeah, oh, the curves themselves. Okay, I'll, I'll come see. Everyone else, um, if you, I would believe you can keep setting it up. Yeah, this one is an apple. Yeah, it's a lot more. 
Perfect. Um, so just know the daily quarter is always the there you go. So we'll just finish up with the dendro. Okay, so we've got the curve to volume, we've got the settings. Uh, we'll need a radius value for this. I'm not sure what it would be. But just remember the radius has to be higher than the settings value. So I just did a slider that's greater than one. Not sure what the radius is yet, but we'll figure that out. So settings, radius, and then we have the curves. Plug that in. It's taking two seconds. Just curious. Um, I believe our mannequin is very big, so we might have to go, yeah, larger than one at this case. So if we if we right click on the slider, we can edit the values of the slider. So right now one is still too small. So I'm just gonna make this bigger. We'll go to like five or something. And now our slider is gonna update so we can slide it to be bigger. Okay, so going, going larger, um, we can see everything's happening quicker. So that, that's good to see. Looks like the radius is also too small, so I'm going to make this max value also larger. Okay, so now we can see the pipes of our simulation. Um, I'm going to preview off everything beforehand. We don't need that. Okay, so everything is a pipe, which is great, but there's other things we can do if you want to make it a little bit more interesting, as always. Um, let's just see here first. We do have one volume, so we could smooth it out. And we could do more iterations of the smooth volume if we want to kind of change the output here. So now it's less pipe-like and more just a very interesting mesh. We've kind of we we've lost those intersections between the pipes and it's all a smooth surface now, which is pretty cool. I mean with the smooth volume, there's a lot of options here. The main one that I play with is going to be the iterations. But we can also change the type of smoothing. Right now we're doing a mean smoothing, so it's taking the mean value between all points and smoothing it out. Um, but you could do Gaussian, Laplacian, Median. Different ones give different results. And you can pick these. If anytime you see an input and the prompt is 0 equals something, 1 equals something, all that's asking is for a number input. So if we use a slider from 0 to 3, uh, we can flip between those different inputs. So we've got Gaussian on 0, um, a Laplacian result on 1, the mean value on two and then the median value on three. So just slightly different options for, for how the smoothing works here. Um, I'm getting an error that the solution is affecting object that has not set in the second object. Does that mean mm. it doesn't have the textual output anywhere? Or um and you're running windows okay sometimes it happens with dendro that it just doesn't like to do anything with the curve yeah. we've had this issue before though so if you go to the file sharing section um if you grab this curve from point file from one of the first classes mm -hmm. what this one's doing is it's basically going to break your curve into points and then give all those points a thickness which it's going to give you the exact same result as what we did. Um, so I'll, I'll open that up as well, just to look at it. Did it just open another rhino? Well, the other rhinos should still be there. It closed the other rhino? Uh -huh. 
weird. <laughs> um, well, I can give you this file. Okay. Yeah. Wait, so did you click the grasshopper file and it opened? It's so it it's so weird. It deleted the other Rhino iteration, though. Yeah. I feel like it should. It it usually keeps the other one open. Oh, yeah. But it won't let me can I have two grasshopper windows open at the same time? Yeah, do you um I mean if you only have one copy of Rhino open, then they're all gonna be in this list. But if you have two copies of Rhino open, then you can have two copies of Grasshopper open at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> And then yeah, so yeah, I'm going to open that one as well. So curve from points. So this is what it should look like. Um, basically, it it's the same thing as. So I'm, I'm going to copy it. Come back here. Control Shift V. Put it down. It's going to work the same as the curve volume. So it just has a curve input, which we can see is is named their curve input. Um, I'm gonna put this resolution really high because I know that our settings were really high from earlier. And then we can just wire the curves in. And this is gonna do the same the same thing as the curve to volume. Um, just, the, yeah, the same curves, yeah. It, okay. Yeah. What's the what's the uh, volume pipe radius? Uh, one point five. The one below it. What is that one at? Oh, point four. Okay. Yeah. When it comes back, hopefully, just put it up to like five or six or something, and it should work. Basically, all this is doing is it's dividing your curve into a lot of points and then giving each of those points a thickness. Um, I just have it mathed out right here, so it's easy. Okay. Yeah. But always just keep that in your back pocket in case for some reason the curve fails. This always works. Um, cool. Yeah, that's pretty much it. We can just convert this back into a mesh. And we could give it a custom preview as we've done before with the color swatch. And this will just show it. Um, a little bit nicer than that translucent green or red. Um, did someone ask why it's pink? Okay, yeah, it's pink by default for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, if you made something cool, feel free to share a screenshot. It's always fun. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll share this.
Okay, hopefully that works. Yeah. The way control. On which component? What 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 component is it on? Uh, the, yeah, and then the error is on which one? Yeah, that one didn't work before. But what is? I don't have anything that says character volume. It says that's when it says that. What does the points to volume say? Volume? Yeah, the one just above it. Oh wait, are you using your file still? Because uh, uh, I just shared this one. Yeah. No, you gave me that. Um, oh, okay. Um, yeah, make the radius it's like larger, six, six or something. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, let me see. Now it should all work. Um, 
Ooh, nice. That's cool. Um, Cam, then I'm assuming you turned the smoothing up a lot. Did you use a different smoothing setting instead of uh, like median or lapilation? No, I didn't mess with the setting. I think I just turned the slider up pretty high. Yeah, it's got a... It's like a bug. Yeah, like a bug, <laughs> crab, something. <laughs> That's cool. Oh, nice. Yeah, I do. Somehow it is always super villain. It's cool. Yeah. It, it's got like a crown at the top. Yeah, oh, no, horns. <laughs> fun, fun. Oh, whoa. Isabel, how did you do this? <laughs> You can zoom in. That's cool. Oh, fun. I like the color. Um, Andrew, that. Uh, that's that one's super cool. I'm jealous of the people who somehow have shading when they do that color method because mine is is flat. I don't know, but cool, nice. Yeah, well, it looks like it worked out. That's all I have for today. So, um, yeah, again, next week we'll take a look at kicking off the final project ideation. So, if you have ideas for the final project. We can talk about it for the first like half hour or so during class. So come up with something. We can have some fun with it. So yeah. Um, again, the rubric is in here, but that's all I got. Oh, Andrew, smart. <laughs> <laughs>